there's Friday, everyone. Um, there's only one Zoom account from the clinical problem solvers today. That's because Reza and I have merged our Zoom screen. Look. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Reza. We're actually hanging out in person today. Um, and that's because Reza decided to come to the better coast, um, the West Coast, and is hanging out in San Francisco. Um, and we're so, so excited to do VMR together and hang out with our beloved VMR community. Um, I'll pass <laughs> I'll pass the mic. Oh, fair enough, Anne-Marie, it is debatable. We can debate about it for sure, but I think the conclusion is not debatable. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, I would, we, you know, this party is a great party no matter what, but we would have a uh, love for some of you to volunteer. Um, so I can witness Prof Rez's uh, magic ooze my way. <laughs> um, so if you have a case, please want to volunteer to present it. In the meantime, I'll pass the mic to the waking uh, Reza Manesh to Good say hi. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Welcome to another special RLR from Ravi's office. Um, I can confirm that he is as majestic in real life as he is virtually. And I can also confirm that his computer doesn't have high pixel image because I, I look a bit blurry. Usually my bald head looks a little more shiny. shiny. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, would love a tour. Yes, Anne-Marie, we will give Wait, it of his shiny head or of San Francisco? <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> look, look, look. And that's the North Pole. <laughs> Head south down that way, um, but who who has a who has a case for today? Oh, Mario is here. Amazing, Mario, awesome. All right, y'all. Who has a case? Would love to nerd out with you. By the way, I'm actually supposed to be technically working right now. <laughs> so, if I if you notice me looking out my uh, this office door, forgive me in advance. Um. We can, what do we want to talk about? You want to talk here while we wait for a case. Yes. Tell us about your run this morning. Oh my gosh. So the run was really challenging. There was an uphill portion to this run that was about, I think a mile to two miles long <laughs> is what it felt like. It's like oh. half a mile. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like two miles long. And I was telling, um, last night I was just sharing that I don't give up when I run. Like I'm always running. But once we hit that hill, I just wanted to give up. And the only reason I kept going was because I said, I don't give up. And I was like, <laughs> I can't be a hypocrite. Like I told them that I can withstand the pain of running, <laughs> but I was ready to give up. But that's when you need friends to push you yes. forward. Correct. Let's, let's make this an inspirational moment. Yes. <laughs> We pushed forward, but I was a little worried. He became, you know, the diaphoresis that you see with acute coronary syndrome, if you've ever seen it before, where somebody just breaks out in a sweat. I uh, passed my stress test today for sure. Did. Very, very well. Um, Still no case, huh? Still no case. Wow. Actually, yeah. Um, if there are no cases, I, I definitely can present a case. Ooh, Ooh. Rafa, let's go. It's R L R L R. <laughs> Say hi, yo. Hi, everyone. Uh, so happy to see Reza again joining us from his um, world book tour. And I hope he's having fun with that. Thank you so much, Rafa. How's your day going, my friend? Oh, it's going great. I just had like this last night shift too. Uh, it, it went pretty well. Like I'm rotating over GYU right now. A whole new world, but I really love it. But I'm still going to into med internal medicine. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I'm sorry, OB Joanne lovers. <laughs> <laughs> Do you deliver any babies? No, no babies. Only gynecological problems last night. I see, I see. But it was fun. Can you tell folks what happens when you see a baby come into the new world? Oh my God. <laughs> I can't help but cry because I see the parents crying and I'm crying with them and oh, it's such a beautiful moment. It's just magic inside of the delivery room. It is. That's why I can't go into Objoy and I will be crying all day long. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you make Reza cry today. A different kind of <laughs> cry. All right. Take it away, my friend. Okay. So um, this is a 40 year old male with two days of bilateral lower extremity cramping and fevers.
Can I, can I just ask for a colleague of mine to do the teaching points? Because I was supposed to do the teaching points today. <laughs> can someone take it over for me, please? And if not, it's totally okay. We can, um, we can uh, re-emphasize learning along the way. It's no big deal at all. All right, Prof. Renz, go All over. right. Well, Rafa, this is a very good stop, stopping point, and you already have piqued my interest. Really, I mean, to take it back to basics, we, Rafa has shared with us a problem representation. We don't have the background data yet, but we have both the tempo and the clinical syndrome. And this clinical syndrome is fever and bilateral lower extremity cramping. What should be our center of gravity? Fever. Um, fever is probably the most specific marker of inflammation. Now, not all fevers are inflammatory are inflammatory, but we sort of use that as our initial hypothesis. For example, endocrinopathies, um, menopause with hot flashes, these can also raise the body temperature or if you're exposed to heat. But let's, we're gonna assume that this is inflammatory in nature and then we can deploy the I made mnemonic. But initially we often start with infection as our main consideration. Once you've identified that someone is inflamed, the question becomes what's driving that inflammation? And this is where you use the patient's history and symptoms to help you zoom in on a possible etiology for the inflammation. This one is not one we often associate with inflammation, this symptom per se, like the bilateral lower extremity cramping. Oftentimes we think about respiratory, gastrointestinal, urinary, maybe even CNS. So what does the bilateral lower extremity cramping do for me? Well, it really zooms me in to the, to the lower legs, specifically the muscles and possibly the venous system. So already I'm wondering if there's some kind of inflammatory myopathy, is there a myositis at play? Um, or is there another you know, sinister process brewing in the lower legs that are causing the cramping? Another, another thing to note is that maybe Something else is causing the inflammation and the legs or muscle pain is just a bystander, meaning it's not actually the site of the origin of the pathology. So I'll leave it at that. I think we need much more information, but basically fever, inflammation, inflammation, more likely infection, then use symptoms to guide you so you can zoom in on what the potential pathology may be. Dude, it's so cool to look at you guys and then look at him and make sure that he, like, of course he's not gonna be like, no, that's not right. I disagree completely. <laughs> Anything to add? Nothing. Okay. Nada. Oh, as you would say, a zero. A zero. Oh, our timing was so off. All right, we gotta work on that. Okay, so <laughs> this is a, this patient presented to the ER with bilateral lower extremity pain and cramping that was described as most intense behind his knees. He, he noticed the onset was while doing ground work on a warm day. And those symptoms were later followed by chills and fever. This patient also recalls a similar episode of a lower extremity symptoms 15 years prior, for which he never sought medical attention. He then developed mild intermittent abdominal cramping and an episode of non-bloody vomiting prior to arrival. When it comes to past medical history, this patient has a well-controlled HIV and sickle cell trait. Our family history is unknown and this patient's uh, medication is on abacavir, dolutegravir, and lamivudin. Social history, he was a farmer smoker and quit one year ago. He drinks alcohol occasionally on the weekends and he also has recreational marijuana, marijuana use. In occupation, he works in landscaping. And that's the end of the aliquot. It's super intriguing. We were just talking about how it's hard to, um, to um, understand, really to make definitive progress. So we're more just like 
trying to understand the syndrome before we um, try to think what it is. It's more like, I think it's more like trying to set up the problem and then begin to solve it. We're more trying to set up the problem. And I think there's so many intriguing dimensions to this. The first is that, um, uh, that the symptoms now are no longer restricted to the legs and now involve the abdomen. Um, that there is a, a, a immunocompromising condition and a vascular condition that HIV and sickle cell respectively in the background. But I think most challenging of all is to say, is something 15 years ago mm. with a normal, um, with a normal inter, presumably a normal period between 15 years ago and now somehow related, like what kind of disease can show up similarly 15 years apart? And um, I don't know if there's a long, there's a list of that, of those things. And so you probably would be like, I'm going to just solve the problem in the foreground and then see if 15 years would help me, but I'm not sure what that, uh, what that invokes. So maybe I can just um, speculate and try to understand the extremity complaints more um, and um, leave the rest uh, for Reza to reflect mm -hmm. on. And I, I, the extremity complaints are a little bit easier because they fall into one of four compartments. If you have something going on in your legs, it's either because there's something wrong in the skin, something wrong in the neuromuscular compartment, something wrong in the vascular compartment, or something wrong in the osteoarticular department. There are four departments. <laughs> And the skin department is not at play here because there's no rash. Um, cramping is evocative of the muscular department and not so much the oste osteoarticular department. So when so many people have, if you've had cramps before, you probably wonder, oh, okay, like, could this be some muscle problem? And um, the spectrum of muscle problems ranges from myopathy to myositis to rhabdomyolysis, and that should be the center of our analysis here. But let me share with you a classic presentation of a very common disease. An 82-year-old man with hypertension, smoking history, diabetes, presents with intermittent cramping of his legs when he walks that resolves with rest. Mm. That's a vascular disease. That is a classic presentation of peripheral arterial disease. And it's not uncommon for muscle disease to result from ischemia of the vessel. The heart muscle is the most morbid muscle that causes pain when it's ischemic, but also the lower extremity muscles. So I'm starting to entertain the possibility that this is a disease of the muscle, a disease of the fascia, mm -hmm. and a disease or a disease of the vessels. So is this an intermittent vasospasm, vasculopathy, vasculitis, thromboembolism, or is this actually a disease of the muscle? And a mimicker of, of this, this common landscape of when you see somebody whose who's muscles hurt, you're like, oh, is it the muscle or is it the vessel? Mm. A mimicker is the fascia. And there are all these esoteric fascial disorders, like eosinophilic fasciitis that can be episodic. Or um, the most esoteric of all, and only mentioned on an RLR VMR, is... Um, is a periodic fever syndrome called TRAPS, where essentially you get periodic inflammation of the fascia. And the only reason I know this is I read about it because we actually have a patient at the VA who comes in here every three or four months mm. for a flare of this condition that causes horrible um, uh, uh, flares of muscle pain. Um, so that's where I'm at with the foreground. I'm like, is it in the muscle, um, which cramping is evocative of? Is it in the vessels, which PAD is a great reminder of? Or is it in the fascia? And then how the abdominal pain helps and how the medical history helps, I'll uh, pass to you because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that was brilliant, Robbie. And I think, again, like our center of gravity has to be this fever. And that's what's perplexing. If Rafa were to say right lower extremity pain and fever, we would think cellulitis. We would think yeah. maybe something deeper, you know, like a necrotizing fasciitis. But here it's bilateral. So I am still trying to um, one frame the problem, but trying to explain the fever this patient has. Like if this is something vascular in origin, you would expect it to be vasculitis, not vasculopathy. That's what the fever does for me. Um, the this, this sickle cell trait, the background of that is important because whatever sickle cell disease can do, sickle cell trait can do as well. And if this patient had a history of sickle cell disease or vasoocclusive crisis, this would be very typical for vasoclusive crisis. That is bilateral lower extremity pain. The thing that wouldn't be typical is the fever. That would be unusual for a patient with sickle cell disease during their crisis to have a significant temperature. The HIV, we, we need to know how well controlled it is. I mean, what is the viral load? What is the CD4 count? Um, in general, patients with HIV are at risk of 
typical infections, opportunistic infections, opportunistic malignancies. And so we need to be open to the possibility of, of multiple diagnoses. Then it's hard to ignore what happened 15 years ago to say, is this a flare up of what was missed 15 years ago and wasn't identified. But the more time that separates two events, the less likely are that the two events are you know, related to one another. I think the abdominal pain and nausea, like it doesn't do much for me yet. There's ways you can try to link the vasculature, like could there be something going on in the mesenteric vessels, the same way that Robbie talked about the peripheral arteries. Could there be an electrolyte disturbance causing vomiting and cramping like hypercalcemia? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to link the two together, but I don't have enough signal yet to try to tie it all together. I think at the end of the day, you take Robbie's four compartments for MSK pain, and then you take the I made mnemonic and see if you can make more progress. The physical exam should be very interesting to look at these these extremities in the labs. Looking at the CK um, would be very intriguing. And, uh, and seeing what the electrolytes are. Beautiful. Rafa, you have, you have me talking about events being related closely and distantly because I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I just, I just want to echo an information shared by Amy K. This is a human Jax case that was made by um, Zachary Kitchen from the University of Colorado. So when it comes to the physical exam, um, the temperature is 104 Fahrenheit. The heart rate is 103, respiratory rate 20, blood pressure 121 over 6 to 7, and he's saturating 92% on room air. Um, this patient um, is, generally speaking, he's conver con conversational and appears comfortable. He's HEENT exam, uh, no conjunctival injection or drainage moist mucous membranes, lungs, um, a normal respiratory effort without wheezings or wails. His cardiovascular exam is normal and with no lower extremity edema. His abdomen is soft, non-tender, non-distended. Um, his MSK exam normal, a range of motion, no tender, swollen, are erythematous joints in bilateral upper or lower extremities, and the popliteal fossa is non-tender bilaterally. I'll give you the initial exam, the initial lab, sorry. The white blood count was elevated with 11.2, um, um, being neutrophil predominant. His hemoglobin was 15, and his platelets were 7 to 7. And there is this interesting BMP. The sodium was 130. And I will leave at that. Awesome. Thank you, Rafa. And just to clarify, on exam, the lower legs look totally normal. Exactly. OK, terrific. Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll tackle the exam and leave the labs for you to, to process. Um, I think here we have like a significant fever. In fact, I would have expected his heart rate to be a bit faster for this degree of temperature. So there is without question that this patient is inflamed. Um, the fast respiratory rate, I mean, 20, like if, if it was actually counted, it would be interesting to see what the patient's lactate level is to see if they have a metabolic acidosis and are they compensating through a tachypnea. Again, when you have fever and you have inflammation, you're trying to identify what's driving it. So you listen to the lungs for crackles. You palpate the abdomen for pain or tenderness. You look at the skin to see if there's any evidence of inflammation. The fact that we can't see anything on the lower extremities doesn't mean that there isn't something within the lower extremities. What I mean by that, what we can see is just the skin, uh, if it's red, if it's swollen. So I don't think we can take off the table something deeper like a myositis or a fasciitis. Um, the necrotizing fasciitis comes in three flavors, one, two, and three. Um, type one is polymicrobial. Type two is monomicrobial and type three is usually um, clostridial species or air producing organisms. 
the monomicrobial, which happens in patients who don't have diabetes, typically the pathology starts in the fascia and then shows itself on the surface and the pain is out of proportion on exam. But there's no reason for me to prioritize fasciitis here by any means. What I get with this physical exam is that I'm really interested to see um, some of these other lab values like the CK, because um, I still don't know what's driving the inflammation that's quite severe in this patient. I love that. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And um, I, I'm not sure, I don't know where to go with the labs. I think that if you layer on the fact that we don't know where this fever is coming from and maybe muscle or, or um, fascia, and you're like, okay, well, what stands out in the labs? I think the white count is not surprising at all. Somebody is acutely inflamed as and has a neutrophilic pleocytosis. And the question is, how is the platelet count helpful? And I think um, in this case, there's anemia, uh, there's thrombocytopenia without anemia. And that just tells you that you're much more likely to have a destructive cause of thrombocytopenia than you are to have a bone marrow problem um, because the sparing of the hemoglobin is much more characteristic of a peripheral destruction, which is either a maha, um, an antibody-mediated platelet destruction or infection-mediated platelet destruction. And the problem is that um, thrombocytopenia can be so nonspecific, it can be a marker of sepsis. And so is the platelet here a marker of inflammation NOS, or does it localize? And if it does localize, it tends to map on most to tick-borne infections, leptospirosis, mm. salmonella, and Bartonella. Like those are the um, four bacterial infections. Again, tick-borne infections, leptospirosis, salmonella, and Bartonella. It is also a feature of malaria and Babesia, which are tick-borne, and a variety of mm. um, viral infections. Um, most importantly, the I think the most important viral infections to know are all the arbovirus infections that can eventually cause encephalitis. And so here you're like, you know what, how can we make this, how can we, how can we use the platelets to help us? And mm -hmm. I think you go back to the history and you're like, it's a warm, dry day. What does that mean? It means that there are probably mosquitoes and ticks out um, on a warm, dry day. So is this actually, is the reason that we're having a hard time localizing this problem because of the fact that it actually doesn't localize anywhere? It's actually everywhere. Um, all those infections, tick-borne infections, um, leptospirosis, malaria, babesia are local, they live in the blood mm. by definition. So they're everywhere. Um, and the the muscle tenderness may be, or the muscle or fascial tenderness may be nonspecific. And so that's where the platelet count takes me. And I think the biggest humbling thing about thrombocytopenia is we've all seen somebody who has infection NOS have thrombocytopenic, but if we're adding value to it, I'm starting to wonder, is this a tick-borne disease? Is this leptospirosis? Is this a malaria, babesia, or is this um, an arbo infection? And that's driven by the fact that this patient is out at a time where they might be exposed. And you, you know, you know what could have happened 15 years ago? A tick bite or a mosquito bite. Um, so uh, I don't know. That's like that's where the platelet count takes me. Um, I've been bitten. I've been bitten by mosquitoes 15 years apart. That's definitely true. So yeah, what do you? I don't know. What do you think about that? I love that. Yeah, I think that's that's brilliant. Now you're layering the the foreground onto the laboratory data and using some of the risk factors as a clue to, to guide you. I think that's that's spot on. Folks, only bad things happen on warm. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> all go out in the sun and have a great time. But hopefully you don't have what this patient has. All right, Rafa, back to you. Okay, so the potassium was 83 and the chloride was 95. Um, the CO2 was 24. The glucose was 109. The BUN was 17. Uh, the creatinine was 1.66 and with an unknown baseline, unknown baseline. And the anion gap was 13. Uh, his ALP was 54, AST 51. Oh, I'm sorry, his ALP was 54, AST 51, and ALT 12. And total bilirubin was 1.3. Um, and the CK was 200 and no, I'm sorry, 2,770. Lactate was 2.5, which is elevated, the upper normal being 2.2. And the ESR was 56. Um, 
just a little bit about the hospital cars. On admission, IV crystalline fluids were administered, which improved his acute kidney injury. However, his fever persisted. His CK continued to climb, peaking at um, 8,046. And that's the end of the other quote. Rafa, do you, uh, I think it got a little, uh, the voice got jumbled when you said the potassium. You remember what it is? Yeah, 3.3. Uh, okay, so I will tackle nothing in past time. I'm just kidding. You know. um, uh, let's see. You know, um, I feel like I talked a lot. So I, I think what, what's standing out to me in this is the AKI, which resolves with fluids, which yes. is basically like pre-renal. So I think the signal on this is the elevated CK, and I don't see much else in the labs unless I'm yes. missing something. So I'll pass the mic to you to talk about how, how you approach CK. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. And um, something that, that was really important is that we often think of tick-borne diseases. Once we see the labs, we see the abnormal liver chemistry test, we see the thrombocytopenia, and we think about non-Lyme tick-borne infections. Here, um, the AST is, is elevated, and it's elevated because you're having some muscle cell turnover. And it's really important to know that a CK of like 3,000 shouldn't cause kidney injury. Like there isn't enough myoglobinuria to result in kidney injury. So now our frame becomes this. A young gentleman, 40, history of HIV on antiretroviral therapy, who's presenting with acute onset fever and lower extremity pain found to have um, elevated CK or myositis. So what is the approach to myositis? And you can't just say, what is the approach to myositis? You have to say, what's the approach to an inflammatory myopathy? Inflammatory myopathy. And you have to keep the thrombocytopenia um, you know, in, the, in the background. I see Kushal has shared something with, uh, with us on Twitter, which I uh, thanks Kushal. <laughs> I hope I can recall some of it. So when it comes to inflammatory myopathies, again, just apply the I made mnemonic and make progress from there. Right away, when you're in that autoimmune category, this story just does not sound like your polymyositis, dermatobiositis, inclusion body myositis, or necrotizing autoimmune myositis. It just, the CK isn't high enough, like the fever is just not adding up. Then I think our attention is primarily in the uh, infectious, infectious bucket. And in the infectious bucket, many infections from viruses to parasites can result in myositis where usually the CK elevation is, is a bystander in that case. Um, so where to go from here? I think the CK is a signal. And once the level gets above 5,000, that's when you can start seeing sequela of um, CK causing damage. And here, maybe we can revisit, Robbie, the list that you shared with the thrombocytopenia and see, you know, like for example, arbovirus, like all of those I can see causing some form of CK elevation. And I think like being at this juncture in the case, like a thick and thin smear is gonna be uh, quite important to see if you see any organism or any clue into a tick-borne infection or, you know, I don't think um, for lepto, I don't think he has risk factors for lepto. He's not exposed to like rat contaminated urine, but I think tick-borne infections, I think the arboviruses in the right context um, are all still fair game. Thoughts on? No, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah nothing to add. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that conclusion. I love the um, like the disconnect between the CK and the uh, AKI is a really good reminder. And um, yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I um, I wonder if in real life you would think about empiric doxycycline at this point. Yeah. Um, because the uh, you know, if the patient gets much better with doxy, it might uh, might be another clue. I, I, I think that's a really good point because if you have this thrombocytopenia yeah. yard work, fever, no other like source. Um, yeah, I think Rafa at this point, like being really concerned for a tick-borne infection that is not Borrelia burgdorferi or Lyme disease, because Lyme typically doesn't affect, you know, the CBC and LFTs. Um, so 
I think that's like thinking about anaplasmosis, uh, ehrlichiosis, babesia, um, and, and stuff like that uh, would be important. We'll see if we see any murulas or something like that on this mirror. What's in your back pocket, Rafa? Okay, so there are two more adequates. Um, this one is about a chest X-ray and it showed a right middle lobe pneumonia. Beautiful. I mean, you go. Oh man. You know, I once made the mistake of tweeting the following. Tick-borne diseases spare the lungs. I swear. And then I was had for breakfast <laughs> on Twitter. Or depending on where you were in the world, you could have had me for lunch or for dinner or maybe a brunch. Who knows? But yes, Kushal already reminded us of the many, two of them, um, one of them at least. There are some tick-borne diseases that can involve the lungs. And tularemia is the most yes. important one, which is, of course, associated with yard work and um, has many forms. Uh, tularemia can present as a primary skin form. Um, called glandular or also ulceral glandular tularemia. It can present as a primary lung form called pneumonic tularemia, or it can present like a FUO, like this case called typhoidal tularemia because it presents a lot like salmonella typhi. And typhoidal tularemia is a great case for a tick-borne infection, which tularemia can be, um, can involve, um, uh, can involve the, uh, hematological system causing thrombocytopenia, it can involve the lungs. Um, the other infection to keep a track of it when you have a mm. systemic infection with lung involvement is Legionella, which can also cause uh, elevations in CK and um, not so much the thrombocytopenia as far as I know. Um, so if you're like, oh, you know, there's a, there, and I, by the way, I, 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 um, I now see it as soon as, as soon as he mentioned, uh, Rafa mentioned the chest x-ray, I looked up and saw that, look at this O2 sat, it's 92%. So there was a subtle clue that I definitely missed uh, that there was some pulmonary involvement along the way. Um, so how can we connect pulmonary involvement to muscle involvement? I think Legionella is a big hit. I think um, tularemia would be another big hit. Um, I think um, anaplasma and ehrlichia and Babesia all can cause ARDS when they're severe, but they're mm. unlikely to present with a focal um, uh, pulmonary infiltrate. Um, uh, Kushal was mentioning it earlier, but hantavirus pulmonary syndrome can also cause pulmonary and hematological issues, but the, the x-ray is usually, again, very ARDS or sort of, um, not. it's not actually ARDS, it's pulmonary yes. vascular leak. So how does lung involvement help us here? I think, um, you have to worry about Legionella though, just like leptospirosis, there doesn't seem to be a reason why this patient would have um, Legionella, which is classically associated with either travel um, or um, uh, human made water sources like air conditioners, et cetera. I think tularemia is a great consideration here, which wouldn't, and it wouldn't respond in doxy. So that's another thing to keep in the back of your mind. And I'm trying to run the list of what do I know about tick-borne infections yeah. or infections that are esoteric that um, mm -hmm. run in the lungs and that's really my short list. What, um, what's crossing your mind? No, I, I, I one, I, I want to thank Kushal because if you say hyponatremia, like opacification, elevated CK, um, Legionella should definitely jump on that list. And I, and I like the idea of um, tularemia as a possibility. I don't have much to add, to be honest. Very interested to see what... Um, you know, Rafa shares with us. And you know, just to emphasize something you said earlier, you're like, oh, I expected the heart rate to be higher. Right. Right. There, there, there was that disconnect, which can be consistent. Oh, with, look. Yeah. Rafael just said it can cause relative. So, <laughs> so that's the, the last other quote. The myositis panel was negative. The ANA was negative. The respiratory viral panel, including influenza, was also negative. COVID-19 was also negative. Strep pneumonia urinary antigen was also negative and a diagnostic test was performed. And that's the end of the article. Thoughts? Um, I don't have too much more to add, Rafa. I think um, where, where I am right now is tularemia uh, given the yard work, but I think Legionella is still, still a possibility. Here, I think the exposure prioritizes tularemia over um, 
Legionella. But if you gave the same story and this patient had exposed, like had traveled, for example, was like a traveler, I think Legionella would be a very good um, final diagnosis for this patient. You, are you? So um, Rafa, what was the diagnostic test? So a uh, urinary Legionella antigen returned positive and he was initiated on azithromycin for Legionella pneumonia. And the following days, fever resolved and CK levels normalized. It was hypothesized that rhabdomyolysis was precipitated by a combination of Legionella, Legionella infection and exertional injury in the setting of sickle cell trait. And there's this clinical pearl that I really loved that while Legionella is clinically and radiographically similar to other forms of pneumonia, features suggestive of Legionella include gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hyponatremia, relative bradycardia, elevated AST, ALT, elevated CRP levels, and failure to improve on beta lactam monotherapy. That's phenomenal. And it's just like so interesting. I think like when you get to the conclusion of a case, you yeah. look back yeah. and you're like, it fits that frame extreme. Because yeah. it's like, you know, we, we like sort of overlooked the 92% O2 sat. We commented on the relative, rate, but we didn't make too much of it because you're still in the low hundreds. Yeah. We didn't use a ratio. But if you said all of that, that the way that Rafa had framed yeah. it, totally. I think like a medical student would say, oh, this is Legionella. 100%. Um, huge shout out to Kushal for calling out the diagnostic test. But the one thing I will say, you have to be cautious with this. Yes, I think, okay, Kushal's already making that teaching point. It is only a serotype one, which is responsible for 85% of Legionella, but it doesn't pick up, you know, all the other serotypes, which there are several serotypes of Legionella, the urinary antigen. So even if the urinary antigen was negative, I still think there would be concern uh, for, for Legionella in this case. I think that's a very important point. 100%. Your, your thoughts, Robbie? No, I agree. Like, if you look at those, if you just look at the vitals, you're like, there. there's a fever, so there's inflammation. Yeah. There's hypoxia, so it's a probably pulmonary inflammation. Pulmonary inflammation is usually pneumonia, and the most common cause of a pneumonia with relative bradycardia is Legionella. <laughs> so you could, like, think about this case just from the vital signs. <laughs> but then the hard part, I think we always struggle. We try to find the perfect match. Yeah. Here. And what I'm still trying to learn is what was the risk factor for this patient getting this uh this infection, and I think for me, that's a that's an unanswered question. But you know, risk factors are just risk factors. You can get many diseases without risk factors. Have you seen a patient with coronary artery disease who is 23? Yeah, of course you have. So I think um, uh, I think that it's always hard to say, oh, there's a piece of the puzzle that's missing. Does that mean it's wrong? Yes. But I think if you were, if you say if you add in that this patient was sitting next to an air conditioner because it was a warm, dry day, <laughs> <laughs> then there's your answer. You know. The other thing I'll say too, Robbie, is like a point you made, like something happening 15 years ago. Yeah. I just feel like the more time that separates two yeah. events, the less likely that those two events are linked. 100%. You know, so I think that was really important. It could be like a red herring because if you try to link them, then you start thinking about recurrent diseases like auto-inflammatory diseases or autoimmune diseases. But uh, 15 years, we should have just been like, okay, we we track that, we note it, but, but move on. Um, there was a good RLR episode. I think it was the first one Robbie presented to me that was Legionella. And we learned that 25% yeah. of returning travelers um, are at risk, you know, with, with Legionella. But so who's doing the teaching points today? Well, can I make what can I say? Oh, one please. Thing I just remembered? And they also, the, another name for Legionella is summer pneumonia. Really? Because like, you know, warm, dry, most people get pneumonia, get pneumonia in the winter. So pneumonia on a warm, dry day, another that. Legionella. All these summer pneumonia. Summer huh? pneumonia. Yeah. So if you know somebody now who doesn't, who's vaccinated against COVID, who comes down with pneumonia now in July in the Northern hemisphere, um, consider Legionella. That's my teaching point of the day. What a teaching point. All right, Gabby, to you. <laughs> what a teaching point. <laughs> yeah, a great case. I love to see Rabbi and Reza in the same room <laughs> discussing this case and half of presenting it. So very, I've learned a lot with it. Um, so, the teaching points, uh, we started discussing fever as a marker of inflammation, and we have to differentiate it from increased body temperature, for example, when there is exposition to heat. And we talked about the mnemonic IMAGE, which stands for infection, malignancy, autoimmunity, drugs, and endocrinopathy. Uh, this patient had uh, lower legs, uh, sorry, had legs, 
like stain. And we have to think about skin, neuromuscular compartment, including fa fascia, osteoarticular, and vascular. When it, we think about skin, rash is usually present, and some causes like cellulitis and necrotizing fasci fasciitis are usually unilateral. Uh, when we think about vessel, we can think about vasculitis versus ves ves vasculopathy. And this patient had fever, so we had to think about vasculitis. And reg regarding the previous medical history, the patient had sickle cell disease and the vasoclusive crisis usually is not associated with fever. And regarding the HIV, there is increased risk of opportunistic infections and malignancies. Uh, when we have norm, uh, leg pain with a normal leg exam, which happens, happened in this case, we have to think about myositis and fasciitis. And there are three types of necrotizing fasciitis, which are type 1 polymicrobial that starts on, on the fascia, and pain is out of proportion on exam. Type 2 is monomicrobial, and type 3 is associated with uh, colostrogen infection. This patient also had thrombocytopenia without anemia, and we have to think about destructive cases instead of bone marrow problem. And destruct destructive causes can, do, can be due to antibody or infection. Um, some causes of infection mediated platelet destructions are the four, the, the main four are tick-borne, leptospirosis, salmonella, and bartonella. AST is also elevated in diseases that increase muscle cell turnover. And when we are evaluating possible inflammatory myopathies, we have to also apply the IMA mnemonic to find the cause. Uh, we also discussed two causes that of tick-borne diseases that involve the lungs, and the, there are tularemia and legion, legionella. Tularemia can have three forms, skin, pneumonic, or typhoidal form. And legionella, which was the final diagnosis, uh, the clinical peril is that it is usually associated with GI symptoms, hyponatremia, relative bradycardia, elevated AST and ALT, failed to improve after beta-lactamic therapy, and this is what we had in this case. Thank you so much for the discussion, and that's it. <laughs> Yeah, and a huge congrats to Gabby who did both scribing and teaching points today. Unreal, yo. Woo! Rafa, you set us up for this. You're like the sodium's 130. And, <clears throat> and, and but remember who was discussing the lab. It wasn't me. And, and, and I, I even I even put I even put the red around the hyponatrium just so you guys should look at it. But it didn't. <laughs> Everyone I was like, we missed the diagnosis. Let me remind you that we got the diagnosis. <laughs> uh, amazing. Well, happy Friday. Always a delight to hang out with you. Um, I don't know what we're going to do. Reza, I think my, my boss who, um, uh, who uh, Reza has a fascinating relationship with, <laughs> so we're going to put, we're going to put Reza to work to start to see patients. So if you get a, a tweet or two from Reza, <laughs> him being regretful that he came here, it's not VMR, it's the patients that we're going to make him see. <laughs> all right. Thank y you all so much. Have a wonderful day.